Good morning. If you've got your Bibles, open them up to John chapter 15. That's where we're going to be today as we uh, conclude our series on Created for Significance. And today I think we're going to conclude it in a fitting way as we talk about the fact that any significance we're going to have and any significant thing we are going to do for the kingdom of God is going to require us to be dependent on Jesus. There is no significance without our dependence upon him. There's nothing you or I or anybody else can do that is going to ever, ever be spiritually significant unless we're attached to Christ. So uh, as we prepare to talk about that, as we conclude the series today, I want to ask you a question. How many of you have ever heard the saying, the proof is in the pudding? Y'all heard it? Tell your neighbor the proof is in the pudding. Tell your other neighbor, because they don't believe you. (laughs) Tell them, the proof is in the pudding. How how many of you have, um, how many of you have ever told somebody that? Okay, most of you. How many of you know what it means? (laughs) Not near as many of you. Y'all are like, I don't know, maybe it's a trick question. It is kind of a trick question. You know, I was reading through John 15 this week and kind of putting this message together and uh, that, that phrase just kept coming to my heart. The proof is in the pudding. It's a phrase I've said a bunch, but, and I feel like I know what it means, just like you probably feel like you know what it means, but I, I didn't have any clue where it came from or what the original meaning behind it was. And so I started doing some research, and uh, I was surprised by what I found. The proof is in the pudding is a saying that's been around for a long time. A lot longer than any of us. It's first recorded in writing uh, in the 1600s, but many people believe it dates back to around the 1300s when people started using it uh, quite, quite commonly, but they used it in a different way than we use it. The original saying was not even the proof is in the pudding. The original saying was this, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. That's what people would say. The proof of the pudding is in the eating. Now, you have to understand, to get the context of what all this means, that back in the 1300s, 1400s, 1500s, 1600s, way back then, pudding was very different than what we have today. Again, something I had no clue about until I I started researching this. And they would say the proof of the pudding is in the eating because of what pudding was. Back then, pudding was... uh, it was not what we think of today. It wasn't a cold, creamy, sweet, gooey, delicious delicacy. Back then, pudding was a, uh, a substance that, that common people, lower class people, ate a lot. And what it, what it really was was kind of a hodgepodge of things. It had minced meat in it. It had spices to try to cover up some of the the flavor. It had cereal in it. They would mix blood in it to thicken it up and and (laughs) yeah. It 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 was kind of just a bunch of stuff that they couldn't use for anything else thrown together in this sausage like animal casing. And they would steam it or they would boil it before they ate it and they consumed it. You know, kind of like what we might call a hot dog today. (laughs) Just kind of all the extra stuff nobody wants to eat on its own. You just mix it all together, put it in a casing, boil it or steam it, and then go and eat it. But anyway, because they didn't have refrigeration back then, and the sanitary practices weren't near as good as they are today or up to the highest standards by any means, many times the pudding would make people sick. When you would eat this pudding, so-called pudding, you would get sick. And sometimes, if you ate some really rancid and raunchy pudding, people would die from it. Whole families would die because they ate bad, rancid, nasty pudding. And so they would say the proof of the pudding is in the eating. In other words, you had to eat the pudding to find out if you were going to get sick or not. (laughs) And if it was good pudding, you wouldn't get sick. 
The proof would be in the eating of it. And if it was bad pudding, you would get sick. And again, the proof would be in the eating of it. So as we bring this series created for significance to a close, I I want us to look at this text in John 15, 1 through 8 together. These words were spoken by Jesus shortly before he would be arrested, tried, if we can call it even a trial, a mock trial, and then crucified on the cross for our sins. And the bottom line here, guys, is I know that every single one of us, I mean, you're here at the early service for church on a Sunday morning where you could be somewhere else, you could be doing something else, and you're here, and and I believe that's because you want to be a, a disciple of Jesus. I believe it's because you want to be faithful. I believe it's because there's something in your heart that says, I want to be fruitful, uh, you, you're, not, you're not here to be entertained. You're not here because there's something in it for you. You're, you're here because you love the Lord. And you want to be a faithful, fruitful disciple of Christ, someone who is dedicated to the kingdom. And God has significant plans for your life, but we cannot forget the big idea for today, which is this, that we can do nothing significant without Jesus. Nothing. Nothing. There's nothing you or I or anyone else can do because he is the vine and we are the branches. And apart from him, apart from the vine, we can do nothing on our own. As God's people, we live our lives in total dependence on God, or at least we should. This text has three main parts to it or three main points for us to consider today. And these three points are all things that we should take seriously. None of them are more serious than the other. They all build on each other. So I would encourage you to jot your notes down and make your notes and then go back today, later today, or maybe tomorrow, or maybe this week at some point and kind of um, revisit it and study it and apply it to your life. So I want to break this down into three kind of big areas for this text. The first is what I call the proclamation. Jesus starts here with a very, very significant and a very important proclamation or announcement that we have to understand to comprehend the significance of the passage. And we have to understand it not in our context, not, not, not here today, not now, not what it means to us. We have to truly understand what it meant when Jesus said it what it meant when he spoke these words, how, how the listeners who first heard these words would have understood it. And, and here's what it says in the ver- first two verses of John 15. Jesus, again, speaking here, says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. Every branch in me that does not produce fruit, he removes, and he prunes every branch that produces fruit so that it will produce more fruit. Now Jesus is somewhat in this first verse here introducing us to the characters of the text, if you will. He proclaims who this is about and who this is for. He proclaims who this is about and, and, and who this affects. His first proclamation is, is significant. They all are, but this first one is huge. And this first one is the one we really have to understand the context of. He proclaims these bold words. He says, I am the true vine. He doesn't say, I am a vine. He he doesn't even say, I am the vine. He says, I am the true vine. Now, why would he say that? Why why would he say that he's the true vine? Why would he make that a point of emphasis? Why why would that be significant? And and the reality is, is that's more significant for the people then than today. They understood that word true, true vine, differently than you and I would. We look at that and we go, of course you're the true vine, because we're disciples of Christ. But when he said this, what he's actually doing is he's attempting to make the Jewish people of his day understand what he is saying. And, and by the way, this isn't going to make them happy. Because you see, if you are a Jew, 
In this day, if you're a part of the Jewish nation, in this day, you have been taught your entire life that you are the vine. You've been told your entire life that the Jewish nation is the vine. They had long understood and believed that they, the Jewish nation, were the vine, the vine of God. They believed that they were the vine by which and through which God was going to sprout branches and impact and redeem the world. We see verses in the Old Testament that proclaim this. And these are the verses that the Jewish people had hung on to for generation after generation after generation. We don't have time for all of them today, but let me read a few. Psalms 80 Verses 8 and 9, you dug up a vine from Egypt, you drove out the nations and planted it, you cleared a place for it, it took root and filled the land. Isaiah 5, 7, for the vineyard of the Lord of armies is the house of Israel and the men of Judah, the plant he delights in. He expects He expected justice, but saw injustice. He expected righteousness, but he heard cries of despair. Jeremiah 2, verses 21 and 22 says, I planted you a choice vine from the very best seed. How then could you turn into a degenerate foreign vine? Even if you wash with lye and use the great amount of bleach, the stain of your iniquity is still in front of me. This is the Lord... God's declaration. Another is in Hosea 1 and 2. Israel is a lush vine, it says. It yields fruit for itself. The more his fruit increased, the more he increased the altars. The better his land produced, the better they made the sacred pillars. Their hearts are devious. Now they must bear their guilt. The Lord will break down their altars and demolish their sacred pillars. It's interesting that when when the Bible in the Old Testament speaks of Israel as being the vine, it, it doesn't speak of them in a good way. It, it says, hey, you, you were the vine, but then you went and messed it all up. I, I started you out this way, and you were planted from the best seed, but then you, you went and did things you weren't supposed to do. You worshiped idols. You, you did all this stuff. You built altars and pillars, and you did stuff you weren't supposed to do. It's, God's not happy with them. But the Jewish people said, but hey, we're the vine. We're the nation of Israel. William Barclay, in his commentary, wrote this. He said the vine had actually become one of the most sacred symbols of the nation of Israel. It was the emblem on the coins of the Maccabees. One of the glories of the temple was a great golden vine upon the front of the holy place. Many great men had counted it an honor to give gold to mold a new bunch of grapes or even a new grape onto that vine. The vine was part and parcel of Jewish imagery and the very symbol of Israel. In other words, he's saying, and and I don't know, I, I, I had never read this before, but I have no reason to doubt him. He's saying that inside the temple in one of the most sacred places, there's this golden vine And people who were wealthy would come in and they would donate to the temple so they could put a bunch of grapes or even a grape on that vine as a symbol of being attached to it. This is a great symbol in Israel that all Jewish people have been holding on to that they are the vine. And then here comes Jesus and Jesus says, hey, wait a minute. I am the true vine. You're not the vine. I am the true vine. I am the pure vine. I am the holy vine you failed to be. I'm the vine. Now that is a bold proclamation that the Jewish people certainly would have understood much better and much differently than we do today. And they most certainly would have taken offense to it. The next proclamation in this text is about God Jesus says, I am the true vine, and then he says, and my father is the gardener. Now, we don't need to spend a whole lot of time here. This is pretty self-explanatory. It's pretty obvious what that means. But basically, Jesus is just saying, God's in charge of the entire garden. God is not gone. God is not distant. God, God hasn't just abandoned us. He's the gardener over the garden. 
And Jesus is actually not, not using this analogy primarily to identify the relationship um, or define the relationship between him and God, and that's how some people try to take this text, but that's not really what Jesus is doing. He's not trying to, to separate himself from God or to show these distinct relationships between him and the Father. What he's really doing is he's just using this as a big illustration to say that, that God is over everything still. He's still in charge of the garden. The garden he created, by the way, in Genesis, right? There's imagery here that he's playing on, that the gardener is still in charge of the garden. And the gardener cares for both the garden and the vine that is in the garden, and Jesus is the true vine according to his proclamation. So the proclamation here is that the gardener is large and actively in charge of the garden, even though it may not seem like it at the moment. And I do want to take a minute here in the last part of the proclamation, because this is where we find our place in the story. And, and this is another very important part of the proclamation. Jesus goes on and he says, every branch in me that does not produce fruit, he removes, and he prunes every branch that produces fruit so that it will produce more fruit. And again, as I said a minute ago, I think y'all are here because you desire to be dedicated, disciplined followers of Christ. You want to be a disciple. And so we have to understand where we're at on this vine. There are two kinds of fruit Jesus talks about here, two, two kinds of branches. There's only two. There's the branches that bear fruit and the branches that don't bear fruit. Branches that produce fruit and branches that fail to produce fruit. Now, a casual reading of this text would, would lead us to a very natural dilemma, a very obvious question that is not at all what Jesus is trying to get at, but I want to approach it because I know a lot of people read this text. I've even seen preachers and heard preachers preach from this text and, and draw this conclusion, which is a false conclusion because it's not at all what Jesus is saying. But the natural dilemma or the national question is this, can you lose your salvation? Is, is Jesus here saying that, that the, the fruit that's not, or the branches that aren't bearing fruit um, have lost their salvation? In other words, they're being cut off even though they were once attached. And the answer, of course, to that is no. I mean, we, we, we know from the scope of Scripture that that is not true. We know from the scope of Scripture that can't be accurate. And we don't have time here today to unpack all of the Scripture outside of this text that goes with that. But we, we can be sure of it even from the context of what we read here when we take careful consideration of what Jesus is talking about and what this illustration and analogy is supposed to mean. Jesus, Jesus is, is making us aware of a situation that has developed inside of his group of disciples that he knows is going to be present inside of his church. And so he's using this illustration or this analogy to, sh to share a clear way to see who a disciple is and who a disciple isn't. The productive and faithful and prunable branch is identifiable. And the unfaithful, unproductive, worthless branch that has to be cut off and thrown away is also, according to Jesus, easily identifiable by the gardener. See, Jesus is not using this as a point of reference for salvation. He's not using this as a point of reference for your salvation or my salvation. But what, what he's saying is, is that both of these branches have the opportunity or, or could be fruitful, but one chose not to be. And they were never saved in the first place if they are that branch. What he's saying is there are people out there who, who look the part. There are people out there who talk the part. There are people out there who act the part. But they are not a part of the kingdom of God and never were, even from the start. John MacArthur said it like this in his commentary. He says it way better than I ever could. He says, Jesus presented this analogy to his disciples in the upper room on the night before his death. It was a time of intense drama. 
One of the 12 men closest to him, Judas, had revealed himself to be a traitor. By this time, Judas had already left the room to go sell out the Lord to the Jewish authorities and to set in motion the events that would lead to the arrest and murder of Jesus. The Lord and the remaining 11 disciples were about to leave the upper room for Gethsemane where Christ would agonize in prayer to the Father and then be taken prisoner. Always the master storyteller, Jesus wove all the key figures of that night's events into this analogy. He is the vine, the Father the vine dresser. The abiding branches illustrate the 11 and all other true disciples And the non-abiding branches, the non-fruitful branches, picture Judas and all other false disciples like him. One last time before his death, Jesus warned against following the pattern of Judas. He challenged all who claimed to believe in him to demonstrate the genuineness of their faith by enduring faith in him. So, This is not a picture of someone who was saved and then lost their salvation and got cut off from the branch. Rather, it's a picture of a reality that says, hey, not everybody who looks like they're saved is saved. Not everybody who talks or acts like they're saved is really saved. And Jesus is saying the gardener can tell the difference, and what the gardener is looking for is the fruit, So Jesus then builds upon this proclamation to what I call the principle, the the main principle of the text. And thankfully, these principles, by the way, that Christ shares here, they're not complicated, they're not difficult, they're not hidden, they're not mysteries, they're not hard to understand at all. He's, He's making this very simple for us. But even though they're not difficult or hard to understand, they are essential, They're not hard to figure out, but but they're really important that we hear them and we see them and we consider them. Look, Look here at the main principle of the text. He says, I'm the true vine and my father is the gardener and every branch in me that does not produce fruit he removes and he prunes every branch that produces fruit so that it will produce more fruit. You're already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Remain in me and I in you just as a branch is unable to produce fruit by itself. Unless it remains on the vine, neither can you unless you remain in me. See, the main principle is our big idea. We can do nothing without Jesus. That's the principle we have to understand from this is we've got to be on the vine. We can do absolutely nothing unless we abide in, remain in, and stay connected to the true vine. Now, attached to this principle are two important realities that most people never really dive into and consider, but I want you to consider these. The first one is this. The first important reality is this. There is no such thing as a fruitless Christian. There's just not. And, and it's sad, guys, but, and, and I don't want to be the bearer of bad news here because I, I hear people all of the time making excuses for their children or for their spouses, or for their mothers, or for their fathers. And they, they say things, and they mean well, and they're trying to convince themselves. They'll say, well, he, he really is a good person, or, you know, he, he doesn't read the Bible or go to church, but he sure loves God. There's no fruit in his life, or her life, or their life, whoever they might be, but, but I know he's a believer, Church, here's the reality, and you've got to consider this. There is no such thing in Scripture ever as a fruitless Christian. All believers bear fruit. You cannot be attached to the true vine of Christ and be a barren branch. It's an impossibility. He says, every branch in me that does not produce fruit, he removes. And he prunes every branch that produces fruit so that it will produce more fruit. There's only two options there. You produce or you don't produce. Fruitful branches and fruitless branches are not the same branches. And the gardener can tell the difference. And thus, they're treated very differently by the gardener. 
I might not be able to tell the difference. You might not be able to tell the difference. But God can tell the difference. You can't fool God. And what is God looking for? He's looking for fruit. This is why John the Baptist encouraged the Pharisees, by the way, all the way back in Matthew chapter 3. I want you to listen. You've probably heard this text and read this text before, but boy, it makes sense when you're talking about the true vine and, and being connected to the vine. All the way back in Matthew chapter 3, at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, John the Baptist says these words in verse 7. When he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees, the, the top of the top of the Jewish people, right, the religious leaders in the newest nation, coming to his baptism, he said to them, broad of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Now look at verse 8. Therefore, produce fruit consistent with repentance. And don't presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father, for I tell you that God is able to raise up children for Abraham from these stones. The ax is already at the root of the tree, therefore every tree, that doesn't, every tree that doesn't produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. He says, produce fruit consistent with repentance. The fruit of their life as Pharisees and Sadducees was not consistent with repentance. It was not consistent with grace. It was not consistent even with the law of God, if we want to get technical about it. They weren't depending on God in any way, shape, or form. They were doing their own thing, making up their own rules, being their own people, stuck in their own stubbornness. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus said this in verse 17, In the same way, every good tree produces good fruit, but a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit, neither can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that doesn't produce good fruit, guess what? It's cut down and thrown into the fire. And he says, so you will recognize them by their fruit. Now look at verse 21, the very next verse. So you will recognize them by their fruit. Then he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, when are the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name, drive out demons in your name, and do many miracles in your name? There's no such thing as a fruitless Christian. It's an impossibility. A, freight, a fake Christian can be fruitless, but someone who is truly a child of God and connected to the true vine cannot be an empty, barren branch. There's a second important reality here that makes up this principle, and that is this. We can't bear our own fruit. We possess nothing inside of us to bear our own fruit. Look at verse 4 again. Just as a branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains on the vine, neither can you unless you remain in me. We can do nothing significant without Jesus. Look at verse 5, the next verse. I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit because you can do nothing without me. We can't produce our own fruit. The problem is the only way we can produce fruit is to remain on the vine. We can't go off and do it by ourselves. And I want to take a minute here to say something that I think is very important about spiritual fruit. Namely, it's spiritual. <laughs> and that may sound silly, but, but would y'all not agree with me that we live in a very superficial world? We live in a very superficial culture. We are a very superficial people. And what is superficial fruit and what is spiritual fruit are radically different things. What, what the culture values and what we're taught to value and all of this stuff, what, what you might be thinking is fruit might not even be fruit because it's not spiritual. We can be very easily deceived into thinking the wrong things about what fruit is and what fruit isn't in the eyes of God because of the superficial nature of the world in which we live. I'll give you some very obvious examples here just so you can chew on them. 
When somebody has a, a large ministry, even a ministry such as ours, or, or they develop a, a program that grows and impacts the lives of a lot of people in a positive way, whatever it is, people will very naturally go, wow, wow look at all that fruit. Or, or maybe bring it down a notch, and maybe it's a small group leader you know. And that small group leader, it's like their group is always full. Everybody wants to be in their group. And then you're a small group leader, and you're looking over here, and you're going, why don't people want to be in my group? Look at all the fruit they're producing, and, and look, at, look at what I'm not producing over here. Or maybe it's a, a speaker, a well-known Christian speaker, and every time they're speaking at a conference, man, it just sells out. Everybody wants to go and hear, hear this person speak. And we go, wow, they must be producing a lot of fruit. Or maybe we see God financially blessing another ministry, another church, but ours is struggling month to month. Or maybe we see God blessing another family, and ours is struggling month to month, and we go, man, man, they're just producing so much fruit, and God just keeps pouring back into them so they can produce more fruit. Church, here's what you have to remember anytime you see stuff like that. We have to remember that those things may or may not be real spiritual fruit. They, they could be, but they don't have to be. See, the Bible defines fruit in ways that are much harder to quantify than buildings and budgets and crowds and audiences and popularity. I mean, if, 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 we, if we were to define fruit that way, the Apostle Paul would not have been a very fruitful guy. And the guy didn't have budgets, just money flowing out his ears. He was hunted and tried to kill. He had friends, but not near as many as he had enemies. I mean, you would have looked at the Apostle Paul and gone, man, God hates that guy. But you talk about a guy who produced fruit. And a guy whose branch is still producing fruit today. And he didn't have all the superficial stuff. I mean, when he rolled into town, throngs of crowds didn't fill stadiums to hear him preach. But his fruit was spiritual in nature, right? So consider, for example, what the Bible says in Galatians about the fruit of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy, and peace, and patience. The fruit of the Spirit is kindness, and goodness, and faithfulness. The fruit of the Spirit is gentleness, and self-control. Those things are fruit, but they're very hard to quantify and define. Philippians chapter 1, verse 11, we see that fruit, spiritual fruit, is righteousness, and the glory to the praise of God, he says. Philippians chapter 4, verse 17, we see that fruit can be expressed through financial generosity and faithfulness in giving. That's spiritual fruit. In Colossians chapter 1, um, verse 10, and Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, we see that fruit is produced through the work God has called and created us to do, the good works we were created to do. Those, those are fruit. Many verses speak of the fruit that comes from sharing the gospel and seeing one sinner repent of their sins and come to the Lord through your ministry or the ministry of another. Or planting seeds can produce spiritual fruit, even if you don't get to be a part of the harvest, right? These are spiritual things, kingdom fruit. They're hard to quantify. They're not always easy to see, but God, the gardener, can see that fruit. Hebrews chapter 13 talks about the fruit that is produced through the sacrifice of praise. That when we praise God, when we bring our lives to him and we worship him and praise him with true, genuine worship, that's fruit there. And that's hard to quantify. It's hard to see for us because it's not superficial. It's spiritual. My point is that spiritual fruit comes in a lot of different sizes and a lot of different shapes and a lot of different flavors. But all of it comes from being connected to the vine. Another commentator wrote it like this. He said, a branch 
is not self-contained. It's not a self-contained entity. And neither is the Christian disciple. And as a branch separated from the supply of nourishment cannot produce fruit, neither can the false, fake, or fraudulent Christian. Fruit bearing for the disciple is totally dependent on a direct connection to Jesus. Because he's the vine, the true vine. And we can do nothing without Jesus. So reality number one, if we are saved, if we are believers, if we are disciples, true disciples, we cannot be fruitless. It's an impossibility. And reality number two, we can't bear our own fruit. We're just the branch connected to the vine. We get to be a part of the process, but we can't do it without Jesus. Finally, I'll close with this last one, and I call it the proof. Jesus keeps this real simple. It's cut and dry. Look at verse 6. If anyone does not remain in me, he's thrown aside like a branch, and he withers. They gather them, throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you want, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you produce much fruit and prove to be my disciples. One of the commentaries I read this week made an interesting point that I, I had never heard before, I never considered before about this text. I never heard this even in my travels in the Holy Land. What it basically said is this, that in Jesus' day, it was a well-known fact throughout all of Israel that, that the wood of a vine was worthless without fruit. It was an accepted truth. See, the wood of a vine in the nation of Israel, it was too soft to be used for anything else. Couldn't carve something out of it. You couldn't make a piece of furniture out of it. You couldn't do anything with it. The commentary went on to explain that at certain times of the year, the Jews were encouraged to bring wood to the temple to be used for the purpose of offerings and sacrifices and think of that and things of that nature and the only wood that was prohibited the only wood you could not bring was the wood of the vine it was a forbidden wood because it was considered a worthless wood if it didn't have fruit on it and why would anybody bring a vine that had fruit on it you see basically the wood of the vine was good for nothing if it wasn't producing fruit all it was good for was making a bonfire burning it up it really only enhances the picture of what Jesus is painting here for his listeners of the day and how they would have understood it, how they would have comprehended this warning and this instruction. Right before he's crucified, there's two very important and very simple characteristics of those who are truly attached to the vine. And I want to cover those because you're probably going, well, how do I know? How do I know if I'm attached to the vine? How, how, can I really be sure and can I be certain? And the reality is yes. The text gives us two things. Two simple things. Number one, they remain or they abide. If anyone does not remain in me, he's thrown aside like a branch and he withers, Jesus says. Verse 7, if you remain or abide in me and my word remains in you. See, Judas and many other fake, false, fraudulent followers of Christ fail to remain. They, they just don't last. They don't remain. Some leave when it gets hard. Some leave when they get mad. Some leave when they can't get what they want. Some leave when they find what they think is a greener pasture somewhere else. Some leave when the new wears off and they think they've checked the box and they've got their ticket. But the reality is, all who leave were never a part of the kingdom. They were never a part in the first place. The proof is in the pudding, as they say. So we must remain. And then here's the second thing Jesus mentions to those who are truly his, who are truly a part of his vine. He says they produce. As we mentioned earlier, you cannot be a fruitless Christian. If you are on the true vine, you will produce fruit. 
And that fruit comes in a lot of shapes and sizes. That fruit is spiritual, not superficial. That fruit may be hard for me to see, but God can see it. Consider what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 13. He's using a parable here in Matthew 13, but it speaks to this today. He says, so listen to the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word about the kingdom and doesn't understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the one sown along the path. And the one sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. But he has no root and is short-lived. When distress or persecution comes because of the word, immediately he falls away. Now the one who is sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word. But the worries of this age and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. But look at verse 23. But the one sown on good ground, this is the one who hears and understands the word, who does produce fruit and yields some a hundred, some sixty, some thirty times what was sown. Once again, here in this parable, we see those two things, right? The good seed remains. The, the, uh, the, the seed that falls on the other ground doesn't remain. It leaves for one reason or another. But the good ground, the good seed remains. And the good seed produces. The other seed never does. And we can't do this on our own. We can do nothing without Jesus and being on his vine. So I want to close where we first began by saying if the proof is in the pudding or if the proof of the pudding is in the eating, then church, the proof of discipleship is in your relationship to the vine. The proof of you being a disciple or not being a disciple of Jesus is in whether or not you are attached to and belong to the vine, the true vine. It's interesting, in the Gospel of John, there are seven things Jesus says he is. In John chapter 6, verse 35, Jesus says, I am the bread. In John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. In John chapter 10, verse 7, Jesus says, I am the door for the sheep. A couple verses later, in verse 11 of John 10, he says, I am the good shepherd. The fifth one, he said, is in John 11, 25, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. Then he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life in John 14, 6. And this is the last one, he says in John 15, 1. I am the true vine. So either Jesus was really crazy and totally full of himself, or he is the only chance any of us have an eternal life. After he was killed on the cross for your sins and mine, after he was tortured and bloodied and bruised and battered, on his way to the cross, after they poked him in the side with the spear to make sure he was good and dead, and his lifeless body was brought down and placed in a tomb with witnesses to see it all, after they guarded that tomb with a guard of soldiers, on the third day, he rose from the dead. The proof is in the pudding. And I'm grateful the Lord has attached me to the vine. If you are not attached, Jesus is the only way and Jesus is the only vine. Don't wait until it's too late. Don't wait until you're standing before him to find out that the proof is in the eating of the pudding because it will be too late then. Call on him, confess him, repent of your sins, and be saved by the blood of Jesus today. He rose. The proof is in the pudding. Let's pray. If you are here or can hear my voice and have never called on Jesus, 
As your Lord and Savior, we invite you to do that right now. We invite you to pray with us right there where you are, wherever you're seated. You don't have to pray out loud. You don't have to raise a hand. Just say this in the stillness of your heart. Say, Lord, it's me. I confess that I'm a sinner. I know that I've messed things up and gone astray. So, Lord, I ask by faith that you would save me this day. I ask by faith that you would forgive me. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for living for me. Thank you for conquering the grave for me. Thank you for saving me. Father, as we close this hour and as we consider what it means to be your disciple and how dependent we are upon you, Father, we acknowledge that you are the gardener and your son is the vine. We acknowledge that we can do nothing without you. We acknowledge that you're the only way, the only truth, and the only life. That you are indeed the true vine. Father, we thank you for choosing us and for attaching us to this vine. For giving us a purpose, for having a plan for our branch to bear fruit. And Father, I pray that it would be spiritual fruit, not superficial fruit. Father, I pray that our focus wouldn't be on what people can see us producing, but on what we know you see. That our fruit would be reflective of the pure vine that we are attached to. That it would be pure and holy and righteous and good in your eyes, even if nobody else can see it. Father, help us to be the people you have created us to be and to achieve the significance you have laid out for us through our connection to your vine. We ask, we pray, and we believe these things in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen.